It's been five years since the Battle of Endor, and the Galactic Empire, once the image of peak performance and order, is at death's door, controlling barely a quarter of its original territory and being divided amongst its squabbling governors and moths. The New Republic believes the war is all but over, but from the shadows of the Outer Rim lies a threat no one realized. The Empire, long without an Emperor, shall fight back once more with its heir. Welcome to the Wizards and Warriors channel, and we're glad to have you with us for our newest chapter in the Star Wars series. As is our custom, we invite you to get comfortable, maybe get a drink from the Cantina Bar, as we begin our story about everybody's favorite Chiss Grand Admiral, his opening moves in his campaign, and the Battle of Sluis Van. As we enjoy the drama of this fictional conflict, we'll also recommend that any of you affected by real drama in your life, be it from conflict, depression, addiction, relationships, or even sleep, take a look at our sponsor today, BetterHelp. This is an online service that matches you against a huge roster of mental health experts, so that you can get quick and easy access to professional advice and therapy without the usual barriers. You can do everything remotely, and the fees are much lower. They have over 30,000 professionally accredited counsellors, psychologists and specialists available for online chats, video calls, emails or phone calls, whatever helps you the most. Once you sign up and give some details about what you need help with, BetterHelp will get you connected to a relevant professional, usually within a few days, and then you can take it from there according to whatever schedules and methods suit you. So if you have something troubling you but haven't committed to full-on face-to-face therapy, try BetterHelp for a flexible alternative. You can sign up via our link in the description. In the wake of the death of Grand Moff Singe, the most powerful of the Imperial Warlords, his domain splintered into several bickering factions and was eventually swallowed up by the New Republic in what is termed as the post-Singe campaigns. Even after this, Republic control over what soon became known as the Borderlands was tenuous, as the systems frequently shifted their loyalties. In the aftermath of this, both the remnants of the Empire and the New Republic were exhausted, with the Empire suffering from ever-increasing fragmentation and lack of trained recruits, and the Republic was not much better off, with all the shipyards they had recently captured being heavily damaged and in need of serious repair. With this being the state of affairs, in 8 ABY, Mon Mothma suspended all New Republic activity and ordered a revitalization of the military. Seeing that the economy in Imperial space was suffering heavily from the loss of the major trade routes, she opted for a passive strategy to win over the remaining Imperial worlds through financial and commercial incentives. It was under these conditions that Galad Peleon left aboard his ship, the Chimera, to a rendezvous point near the Unknown Regions as ordered, and received the shuttle pod of the last remaining Grand Admiral of the Empire, a blue-skinned Chiss, who greeted him thusly. I am Grand Admiral Thrawn. I have been away, but now I have returned. I know some of what has occurred. You will fill in the details of the rest when I come aboard. Rejoice, Captain, for the Empire will rise again. With Thrawn aboard the Chimera, and having been apprised of any missing details of the situation, the Grand Admiral set about his plan. He made the Chimera his flagship, setting up a second command bridge personal to him, then went to Imperial space and declared himself to the ruling council, who accepted him rather easily. Though the Empire was still a fundamentally human supremacist state, they could not deny that the Chiss held the correct Imperial codes. Using his rank to their advantage, they sought to influence Thrawn as a puppet leader, but the Grand Admiral proved immune to manipulation and unswayable to his ultimate goal, or as he called it, the puzzle. The only puzzle worth solving, the complete, total and utter destruction of the rebellion. Right off the bat, the new Supreme Commander was faced with several problems. Even though the Moths had declared their support for him, they hoarded military resources from him and their loyalties would only go as far as his successes would. So he set his already predetermined plan in motion. The first move was to alleviate the worries of the Moths and fix the instability within the Empire. To this end, he assigned all of the remaining Dreadnought-class Star Destroyers to guard duty around the most important Imperial planets. Next, he set about revitalizing the military, 
installing training programs that paired veterans with rookies, and having the fleets perform training maneuvers on and off missions. He also ordered the construction of new ships, but due to issues in the assembly process, he also began to purchase ships. Soon, Thrawn's Herculean reforms started to bear fruit. When he initiated an attack and fade strategy against the New Republic, it ended the piracy problem in the border regions and reversed the situation along the border. Thrawn's raids all consisted of one highly trained Star Destroyer that would attack their target and disappear from the site. The Republic could only counter these raids with squadrons of multiple ships, meaning their border task forces were doubled by necessity, stretching their already thin line, just as Thrawn intended. These raids also deliberately obscured Thrawn's main military objective, locating a secret storehouse used by Palpatine, whose contents would be vital for the campaign to come. After nearly a year of searching, Thrawn finally discovered the storehouse's location during a raid on the Abroa Sky system, whose library database revealed its location. This discovery was not without its perils. The scout ships dispatched to attain the information were followed by a Republican task force of four assault frigates, who were led right back to Thrawn aboard the Chimera. Thoroughly outnumbered and outclassed, Peleon advised Thrawn to retreat or call for reinforcements. But Thrawn did not yet want to reveal his full strength, nor did he believe retreating was necessary. Thrawn simply ordered the sentry ships to engage the frigates. Keenly observing the task force's reaction, he deduced that they were under the command of an Elom and ordered a Marg Sabal maneuver. Thrawn was devout to the precept of know thy enemy, and through his knowledge of the Elamites, he knew they were an ordered people who couldn't handle unstructured and unorderly things. The Marg Sabal was all those things, and its deployment caused the Republican task force to rout. In their disorganized retreat, Thrawn pursued and destroyed the entire force. With the location of Palpatine's vault now revealed, Thrawn made his way to Mikir, then to the outer rim planet of Wayland, where he proceeded onto the planet's highest mountain of Tantis. There, he found the storehouse, as well as its guardian, a force-sensitive clone of the long-dead Jedi Master Jorus Kabalth. Thrawn had expected to be greeted by a force-sensitive sentry, and initially, Kabalth seemed to be friendly. However, upon entering the storehouse, he revealed himself to be mad and attempted to kill Thrawn, Peleon, and Rook the Grand Admiral's Nogiri bodyguard. Kabalth's force proved unable to hurt the Chiss, for Thrawn had brought with him a Asalamiri, a creature native to Mikir capable of repelling the force. Forced to negotiate, Thrawn brought the Dark Jedi Master to his side with the promise of Jedi apprentices in the form of Luke Skywalker and Leia Organa and her unborn twins, to which he would dispatch his loyal Nogiri commandos. Within the storehouse, Thrawn had found his prize, schematics for a cloaking device, as well as 20,000 Sparty cloning cylinders, which would be instrumental in the campaign. This was on top of his plan to obtain Cabalth as an asset, for he had rightly determined that Palpatine's success on the battlefield was due to the use of battle meditation, an ability which Cabalth could replicate. He quickly renovated the Mount Tantis base bringing in the best of the Empire's personnel for clone templates. Sparty clones were a cut above regular clones, capable of achieving full adulthood in only a year, in contrast to the ten years which was usually required. Thrawn would cut this down to a mere 15 to 20 days through his use of the Asalamiri that he had harvested from Mikir, whose ability to repel the Force could alleviate the clone madness that the Force caused. With his manpower problem resolved, Thrawn began his offensive. Although Peleon was wary with the few ships at their disposal, Thrawn reassured him that only a dozen would be needed for the initial phase. The Republic was ill-prepared and nearly unresponsive to this rising problem, as many believed the Empire already to be beaten, and indeed Thrawn had made sure to keep the appearance that way with the one-ship-per-raid policy and with his attacks directed at non-vital targets. This left the Republic to stew in its own internal issues, leading to corruption, infighting, and the instability that comes with worlds joining a new confederation. Thrawn now began the final phase of his preparations. 
Despite working at full capacity and their dockyards being fully repaired, the Empire could not produce as many ships as clones were being produced. But Thrawn had, as always, anticipated this and set his sights on seizing ships from the New Republic. The operational stage had already been set by thinning out the Republic's border forces. Now he would further divert the enemy's strength and test Cabal's abilities. Thrawn personally led a three-prong hit-and-fade attack within the Saluis sector, with the main group attacking Bupfash, where he encountered a larger force yet again and defeated them thoroughly. A victory won not only through Thrawn's own capabilities, but also Cabalth's battle meditation, which increased the attack force's performance by over 40%. Although the operation was successful, the Nigiri failed to capture Leia Organa, who arrived on Bupfash with Han Solo in the aftermath of the attack to assess the situation. Ultimately, Leia's life or death meant little to Thrawn in the long run other than distracting high-profile targets and keeping the insane Cabalth happy. Next, he sent the Judicator to Niklon, where it raided Nomad City, a mining colony under Lando Calrissian. The Judicator successfully captured half of the colony's drill jets, known as Mole Miners, before fleeing the system. There, the Judicator also encountered not only Han Solo and Leia Organa, who had just arrived from Bupfash, but also Skywalker himself, these heroes of the Rebellion proved unable to stop the Imperials, misunderstanding the Imperials' main goal as the capture of Nuklon. During the battle, Cabalf communicated to Skywalker through the Force, alerting the Republic to the fact that a Dark Jedi had appeared in the region. As it turned out, Thrawn had leaked this information intentionally to lure Skywalker. Thus, Skywalker made his way to Jamark, where Cabalf had said he'd wait for him. One thing that disturbed Leia Organa and her companions was that the Imperials always seemed to know where she was without fail. This worry was also felt within the Republic hierarchy, which attributed it to an effective Imperial spy network. In reality, Thrawn held a deadly advantage over Leia, which he had acquired from Palpatine, the codenamed Delta Source, a twin row of Kachala trees within the Imperial Palace on Coruscant that were used to secretly monitor the planet, unbeknownst to the current Republic administration. With everything in place, Thrawn decided to tie up loose ends. Having sent a probe to Nuklon, expecting Leia to be with Luke there, and having discovered that this was indeed the case, he further correctly deduced that she left with Calrissian to Kashyyyk to hide her, and the Millennium Falcon's departure was a ruse. So he left this to the Nigiri, while he himself planned to ambush Skywalker en route to Jamark and make it look like an accident so as not to displease Cabalth. The operation was initially to kill Skywalker, but Thrawn was talked into capturing him instead by Peleon, who brought up Cabalth's paranoid, unstable mind as a reason not to give him exactly what he wanted. The ambush ultimately failed as Skywalker's quick thinking allowed him to escape, but not before seriously damaging his hyperdrive. Furious at being outwitted, Thrawn set a bounty on the young Jedi, leaving the rest to nearby bounty hunters and smugglers, namely a smuggler ring led by Talon Kard based on Mikir. With that, Thrawn began his first major operation. His target, the Slowisvan shipyard, which was considered to be the best in the Outer Rim. Even though this shipyard contained over 100 capital and smaller ships, it was virtually unguarded by the New Republic thanks to Thrawn's prior attacks and the false appearance of few ships in the sector. Thus, during its day-to-day -day operations, a Republic PCL-27 A-class bulk freighter named the Natis II arrived at the shipyards, reporting to Slewis Control that the ship had sustained damage from a pirate attack and was forced to dump its cargo to escape. Slewis Control scanned the ship and found nothing amiss, and gave it the all-clear to approach. But on-station officer Wedge Antilles and Afyon thought the freighter acted odd and sent Rogue Squadron to inspect the ship, which promptly exploded when they approached, splitting in half, and from the supposedly empty cargo space came 40 TIE Fighters, led by Cloak Leader, as well as 51 Mole Miners in support that had been successfully hidden with the cloaking device Thrawn obtained from Wayland. They were soon followed, nearly immediately, by the arrival of Thrawn's fleet, 
accompanied by 12 strike-class medium cruisers, 22 carrick-class cruisers, and their personnel and fighter wing complements. Thrawn gave the order to attack, and finished the order relayed to Peleon, saying, Remember, we're here to gain ships, not lose them. And Captain, remind them that our final victory over the Rebellion begins here. Thrawn's main fleet set upon the defensive perimeter, pinning them down and forcing them to fight, as Cloak Leader penetrated the perimeter with the Mole Miners following, as they quickly latched on to the docked ships, carving into them for the boarding teams of five space troopers to capture them. This was so effective that some fell within minutes. Not long after, the Millennium Falcon arrived with Skywalker's ship in tow to repair it. Discovering the situation, they immediately contacted Wedge Antilles and began to coordinate defense and counterattack. But this was unsuccessful, as the Imperial teams aboard the captured ships were able to pick up their communications and relay them to the main fleet, who acted promptly. Soon the Republic could do naught but watch helplessly as more and more of their ships departed the docks towards the Imperial fleet, trying all the measures they could to reclaim these vessels, but to no avail, as the vessels themselves fought back. It seemed the Imperials would be able to flee with their captured ships, but it was then Han Solo realized that Thrawn had failed to jam the comms, so suggested to Calrissian to use his command codes to override and activate the mole miners who could cut through the ships, crippling them, as they identified them as the ones captured from Niklan. Though they were to lose the ships in the process, they had no way of retaining them, so Calrissian sent the codes. Over 40 ships were taken out of action, with a few self-detonated by the Imperials. With the ships now lost, Thrawn ordered a withdrawal, to the shock of the rest of the fleet, who expected to alter the attack and destroy the enemy. But he had judged that the loss of their prize made it unreasonable to remain. And so they left the system, leaving the Republic with what is known as a Pyrrhic victory on one of the backwater planets. With the Battle of Sluisfan, Thrawn's plan had been set back, but only just. Although he had not captured the ships, he denied them to the New Republic, who now needed more vessels to counter this newly arrived threat. Worse still, the Republic forces on the front line could do little to sway those in the capital to act, giving the Grand Admiral free reign to make the next move. To make sure you don't miss the next chapter of Thrawn's campaign, make sure you have subscribed and pressed the bell button. Please consider liking and sharing as it helps immensely, and don't forget to comment. We will try to read and respond to every comment, as we want to know what you think about this video and which videos you hope to see in the future. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel, and we'll catch you on the next one.